Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? It could be a little louder. Okay. So just before Ian um, uh, welcomes us to New Vision United Church and uh, does an acknowledgement of the, of the land, I've been asked to do a few announcements, so why don't I use this time for that? Um, there is a literature table for the Coalition to Stop the War at the back, and you're welcome to browse that and, and pick things up. There are books and um, Palestinian olive oil for sale at the front here, so you're welcome to um, do some shopping there. And I have an announcement from the Oakville Palestinian Rights Association um, of a talk by Father Robert Holmes, who has worked with the, the Christian Peacemakers International. He'll give an illustrated presentation about his experiences in Israel-Palestine um, at the Anglican Church of the Incarnation in Oakville. Free admission, there'll be a free will offering, and it's on Friday, May the 11th at 7.30. So if you're not familiar with the work of Christian Peacemakers International, this is a wonderful opportunity to hear about them. In the evening, there will be um, a couple of uh, sheets where if you would like to learn more about the, about Canadian Friends of Seville, um, you can sign up and put your email address on, or if you would like to know more and keep in touch with events organized by the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute, which is a, um, Rabbi Lucia is a founding member of that. Um, Theological Institute. So we're really proud of, of Lucia and Robert and the work that they're doing at that institute. So those sign up sheets will come around later in the evening, and you're welcome to add your name if you'd like to, to learn more about Sabeel, Canadian Friends of Sabeel or the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute. Ian. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to put this wired mic in here so that we have the wireless microphone available for the Q&E later. And uh, so, uh, watch me do that. <laughs> All right, I think that's, I think we may need to adjust the volume a little bit there, Steve. It's the, uh, here, let me do it. Good, all right. Uh, sorry about that, um, a little bit of, a uh, little bit of technical. Uh... <laughs> yeah, our apologies. It uh, sometimes happens. Um, I'm Ian Sloan, I'm the minister here at New Vision United Church, and I'd like to welcome you all to New Vision for this uh, really important talk. Um, logistics, um, there are washrooms as you came in, um, uh, just inside the door, a handicap uh, washroom back there as well, and then there are uh, a couple just up the stairs uh, going towards the kitchen over here. So I've uh, been asked to, uh, to offer a traditional land acknowledgement, and I'll, I'll do that first and then, uh, and then hand it back over to Diane. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered on the traditional territory of several indigenous peoples, including the Neutrals, the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee. We acknowledge their continuing stewardship of this land. I am Diane Blanchard. I should have introduced myself. And pleased to help moderate tonight's um, event. 
I'd like to introduce Robert um, to speak about the sponsors for this evening. Oh. I would like to say thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, we never get to do these things without a broad range of uh, people who work hard at uh, getting uh, the event together. And so I always like to acknowledge uh, the people that were heavily involved in bringing this together. So the Canadian Justice for Peace and the Peace, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, uh, Independent Jewish Voices, Hamilton, Independent Jewish Voices Canada, uh, Jewish Liberation Theology Institute, that's us, uh, the Palestinian Association of Hamilton, in solidarity for Palestinian human rights of the Master, Church of Cafe, and the United Church of Canada Social Justice and World Outreach Committee. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce, to call on Ted Schmidt. Ted is the former editor of the Catholic New Times and author of a forthcoming book that's entitled, I Was a Catholic Zionist. I met, had the privilege of meeting Ted at a, an event a few years ago where Mark Ellis was a speaker, and I was impressed by Ted's courage. He, has, um, he grew up in a Jewish community and was very um, moved and angered by the injustices that he saw happening to the Jewish children that he grew up with. Um, and that was a very formative um, time of his life. In 1990, he had the chance to visit Israel-Palestine and saw a different, had a different kind of experience. And so that has also shaped his, his prophetic voice over the years. So please welcome Ted Schmidt. <laughs> In Israel, Palestine, there's a, a very famous quotation that the land was going to be taken from the indigenous Palestinian people, dunum by dunum, goat by goat, a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time because they didn't want the power in North America to see what was really happening there. And until the, la until the last 15 or 20 years, Israel has been able to keep this hidden. And now with the advent of cell phone, the advent of handheld devices and Facebook, you cannot hide anymore. And so, dunum by dunum, it's people like us, people like you, individuals who hear and are witness to what is going on. And it is up to us then to pass it on. So I was invited tonight to just give you a brief excursus on what liberation theology is. And it's not very difficult to understand this. But my background in scripture, as having studied in England, uh, I'm a great scripture scholar, uh, it's been wonderful to, to be part of this movement. And when I first said that I was going to Israel, my friend at the Catholic New Times, Mary Jo Letty, said to me, you're going to have your heart broken, knowing my love of the Jewish people. And she was absolutely right. Um, as I said, I've had three heartbreak tours, having been there and walked through much of the West Bank, and particularly the ugly hell called Hebron. Uh, that has really shocked me and made me wonder how could a people who have suffered so much turn around and do such despicable things to another indigenous people. Liberation theology. At the end of World War II, the brilliant Lutheran theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was martyred by the Nazis in April of 1945. He's been part of an underground community resisting the paganization of the Nazi onslaught and the inability of the churches to stand against Hitler. He became part of what they called the confessing church. Because most of the church went like this. Bonhoeffer Bicar became part of the confessing church, the alternative. And 
uh, only the person, he said, who cries out for the Jews may sing Gregorian chant. He was one of them. He escaped. He went to New York City in 1939. He could have stayed there. As a brilliant theologian, he said, no, my place is with the German people. He understood the long history of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism in his own country. In his letters from prison, he died in 1945, he was beheaded. This got smuggled out. In his letters from prison, he wrote, Here remains an experience of incomparable value. We have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the outcast, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, the reviled. In short, from the perspective of those who suffer. This view from below, from the underside of history, would shape the pillars of Western theology and indeed social criticism. To sum up, we see from where we sit. We, speaking for myself, privileged, middle class, white, and male, generally see the world from where we sit. With the rise of technologies which have shrunk the world, we in the privileged north began to hear and see, perhaps for the first time, the voices of those on the underside of human history. The textbooks were largely written in the first world, in North America and Europe. The rest of the world had little voice. This began to change, of course, with the 60s, when so many African and Asian nations wanted to be their own countries. And that has happened. So we see from where we sit, with the rise of these technologies and the shrinking of the world, we began to see for the first time the world from the underside of history. These third world nations, as we called them then, demanded their own voice and agency. They rejected the chauvinist perspective of white, male-dominated, colonial and imperial centers of power. Nowhere more than the United States of America, the most powerful nation of the world. The post-1945 era exploded with this new insight. It's generally called post-colonialism. Sri Lankan theologian Aloysius Pieris calls this a rejection of the unholy alliance of the missionary, the military, and the merchant. So when Columbus planted his flag in Bermuda in the, in the DR in 1492, it was also a flag for the Catholic Church, for an imperial power, which happened to be Spain at the time. An unholy alliance of the military, the missionary, and the merchant. There was a rising tide against domination and imperialism. The corollary, of course, was the cry of liberation from those on the underside of history. So, at this, this post-colonial reading of the Bible, we call liberation theology. A rejection of colonial power, dictatorship, exploitation, and social injustice. The flip side is a massive recovery of dignity for those who have been out of sight for far too long. And here we must include, as we did by Ian, our First Nations people, finally regaining their voice and their agency. For our purposes here tonight, we can easily make connections, first, with the utter colonial attitude of the British Empire, with the accent on empire. Well, who gave the UK the right to is issue the disastrous Belfort, Belfort Declaration, November 1917, which in the famous author Arthur Kessler's words, was one nation solemnly promised to a second nation, the country of a third. 
These, those theologizing within the United Kingdom usually bought the implicit idea of white superiority. They simply accepted the idea that England was bringing civilization to the world. There was little respect, much less understanding of the indigenous people. My good friend, since I've known, since he's 14 years of age, Charlie Angus, is one of the great voices for our indigenous people. And when he came to my local riding, and, I, and he gave me the first question as his former teacher, I said, Charlie, you have to begin to speak of another indigenous people. He admitted to me that the power of the, what I call the Zionist lobby, to shut down critical voices of another state, Israel, is profound. They will come after you. And I said, well, my brother, here's your way intro into the whole question. What are the same the three countries that always vote on the side of Israel? Canada, Australia, in South Africa. And what did they have in common? They all made war on the indigenous people. That's your starting point. You are a defender of the indigenous people. God love your great voice. It's time to amplify that voice because you are a great Christian, a great justice man. Please start speaking. I hope he does. So, missing of course, was the idea that theology done within an empire usually sat back and watched land, land theft, theft, as we did in all those countries, resources, as we've done in all those countries, erase people's histories. Talk about the erasing of the Palestinian people's history. Extraordinary. Unbelievable. Often the colonized would internalize their submissiveness, uh, but with thinking like Bonhoeffer's, the formerly docile people began to assert their dignity. We, and to quote Marwood Darwish, the great Palestinian poet, we are here. We are here, and you cannot deny us. The last 50 years, have seen an emergent Christianity which has taken a critical look at how we do theology. Hence the rise of theologies from below. The voice of women, unheard of. Most of the theologians were male. The voice feminist theology. The voice of the poor, we call liberation theology. Uh, the voice of homosexual people. Gays, the voice of blacks, the voice of our indigenous people, and maybe most important in the history of our world today, the voice of Mother Earth that is crying out for us. So tonight we are very privileged to have with us Naima Teek, uh, who speaks as a Christian theologian, a Christian pastor. Uh, it reminds us where Jesus, the Jew, made his home. He reminds us where he told us we would find him and where Jesus himself lived, a Jew under occupation. Today, under occupation, Today, for far too long, the Palestinian people, tonight we hear the eloquent voice of a man who knows firsthand what this is about. Would you please welcome Naeem Atik. sisters who live in Israel and uh, Palestine and including Jerusalem. So it's very good to be back here. I was here 
17 years ago in this place. I could not remember the dates. I was told the dates, but I remember that I was here. So I'm grateful for, uh, for the organizers of this uh, event. And I'm very grateful for the pastor of the church also uh, that opened the church for us here. So it's very good to be with you. And I am, I want to also greet uh, my friend, Rabbi Lucia. Thank you. Uh, it's very good to be here with you. I want to do two things tonight, but I was told that my presentation is too long. So the first thing that I had to do is to really reduce it quite a bit. And I did not practice it, so I don't know how it's going to happen tonight. <laughs> but I have tried to reduce uh, the presentation. I will begin by introducing the new book. Uh, and again, I will shorten my introduction of that. And then I have a PowerPoint. I need to check whether it is the right PowerPoint that is here because we were rushing, we came late because of the traffic. So uh, it will take also a few minutes after I introduce the book to look just to see that it is the right one. I have a number of uh, 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 PowerPoints here. So I wanna know that it is the, the one that... Uh, so I hope uh, it will follow uh, logically because that's the way it was. Um, so forgive me if it is not going to be um, the, the way I wanted it to be, but I accept the fact that um, we wanted more time for discussion. And so that's why I'm very grateful to be here and uh, to share with you some of my thoughts. So let me begin with uh, an introduction of the new book. Uh, it's a it's really, this book completes a trilogy of books that I have written on Palestinian liberation theology. It draws on some of my earlier writings, but it goes further by expanding the research on this topic. The reader will find in this book history, Bible, theology, and politics. This is our life back home. We cannot uh, say we cannot touch politics. Politics is part of our life. And we as people of faith need to see how we can understand politics, how we can use politics, how we can critique politics. We live our life comprehensively under God. And that's very important. Obviously, I am writing as a Palestinian Christian. I am also an Israeli citizen. This means that I have experienced Israel since its inception. I was a boy in 1948. I will tell my stories when I, we look at the maps during the PowerPoint. But we were evicted from our home in 1948 and I will share some of that story with you. Although I am writing primarily to Christian brothers and sisters, I pray that Muslims and Jews might find the book informative and hopefully stimulating religiously and theologically. In a special way, I hope that the book can be useful for pastors, ministers, priests, I raise many questions and I try to offer answers, but it's very concise and it's my shortest book because I think people don't like to read very much nowadays, so it is very short, but I hope you will find it challenging. I would like to express my appreciation to Professor, Professor Walter Brueggemann, who kindly wrote the foreword for the book. In the blurb on the back cover, Professor Brueggemann wrote, 
This book merits, I'm quoting, this book merits wide attention and close sustained study. For there is so much to unlearn and learn anew. So, what are some of the questions and themes that I raise in this book? What is Palestinian liberation theology? I have, I cut some of those PowerPoint sites on that, you will find it in the book. What is Palestinian liberation theology? And what is, what are the, who are the Palestinian, who are the Palestinians generally, and who are the Palestinian Christians specifically? And what are the main challenges that have faced and confronted Palestinian Christians over the last 2,000 years? You would be interested in this. But I'm not going to tell you, you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> the word Nakba is Arabic and it means catastrophe in English. How many Nakbas or how many catastrophes did we suffer as Palestinians? More than one. I try to explain it in the book. Many people see the Palestine-Israel conflict as extremely complicated. What are the roots of the conflict and how can it be resolved? I try to simplify it and I hope I have managed to do this. For those of you who say, oh, it's too complicated, I don't want to deal with it. The Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, contains various material, some of it palatable and beneficial for Christians, especially some of the Psalms, that lends itself to our spiritual health. As a boy, I learned many of the Psalms by heart, and I still use them part of my prayers. While others are difficult to understand, I mean some of the material in the Old Testament, difficult to understand, and are detriment to our faith and human morality. How can we handle the moral religious and theological discrepancies that we find in the Bible. I'd like to give the reader more than one key that can help unlock those dilemmas. Where do you find the climax of Old Testament theology? This is one of the best things. I, I mean, I just love it. I hope you will love it as much as I do. Where is the climax of Old Testament theology hidden in the Bible? One of the most beautiful stories in the Hebrew Bible that was authored by a very gifted writer is the book of Jonah, the story of Jonah. After thousands of years, it still has great religious and theological relevance for our life. And I'd like to share that story with you and how I see it as containing the climax of Old Testament theology. The Bible does not contain a solution to the political conflict over Palestine. The resolution of the conflict, I believe, must be based on the UN resolutions and the demands of international law. You will see me repeat this more than once. Because I believe we can resolve the conflict. Israel can live in peace and security. But we must base the resolution of the conflict on the basis of international law. So, the United Nations is the address for the resolution of the conflict. But the, the Bible can inspire us to work for justice. 
You remember the words of the prophet Micah, who said, what does God require of us? And the answer came very clearly, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. This is a wonderful verse coming from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the prophet Micah. You know, our conflict could have been resolved long, long time ago, had it not been for Israel's government's disregard to international law. Israel doesn't want to implement international law. At the same time, it's important to remember that Israel would not have committed all those violations without the financial, military, and political support and backing of the United States. What about the city of Jerusalem? In the book, a few months ago, President Trump thought that he found a solution to Jerusalem by declaring it the capital of Israel. His declaration exacerbated the problem rather than resolved it. Consequently, Hundreds of Palestinians have been killed and wounded in defense of Jerusalem. Let me tell you, friends, and you need to listen to this very carefully, please. Jerusalem is equally holy, equally special to the three monotheistic religions. It is wrong to make it the capital of one of the religions and one of the peoples. This is what, this is the blunder of President Trump. He did not resolve the problem. He made it worse. The question of Jerusalem has become more urgent now. We recall the words of Jesus Christ when he looked at Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and before his passion and death and resurrection, he wept over and he said, you don't know what makes for peace. I tried to offer some fundamental guidelines for the resolution of Jerusalem as well as the whole conflict. You will find it in the book. In a nutshell, the political conflict over the land of Palestine has to do with the political theology of land. How did Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul reinterpret the tradition regarding the land? What was their theology of land? This is the most basic, actually, point in the conflict. A the theology of land. So I try again to introduce that to the reader. And I think it will stimulate your thinking. Finally, in this introduction, there are others, I'm cutting them out because of the time factor. When you strip our three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, when you strip them to their basic core, what is the heart of a religious faith in the 21st century? is one of the chapters I have and I hope it will stimulate you as you think about religious faith in the 21st century. Finally, in this part, Palestinian liberation theology, my friends, <coughs> believes that the justice we seek and work for has seven dimensions, essential <coughs> dimensions. Ideally, the justice that we seek needs to be linked to every one of these seven dimensions. And I'd like to end this part by mentioning these seven dimensions. Now, I don't know whether we are able eventually to achieve uh, uh, every one of these dimensions, but ideally, 
These are all essential to the achievement of justice. In the book, obviously, I go a little bit more about every one of them, uh, but here I will just mention them. I might say a few words about one or two of them. Justice must be linked to love. When you love, you do justice. When you don't love, you don't do justice. This has to do with our life at home, with our spouses. It has to do with our life everywhere. Justice must be linked to love. Justice, true justice must be linked to mercy. You know, justice alone can be very harsh. So I don't talk about justice, the harsh type of justice, eye for an eye. No. Justice must be linked to mercy. Justice must be linked to truth. It's very important. Truth is very important. You have to do your homework. Not everybody who says something might be truthful. You gotta document the truth <coughs> of the situation. And I tell you, everything I tell you, I can document it. And nowadays, I don't use, I don't document uh, what I say from Palestinian writers or secular writers. I document it from Jewish writers. Secular Jews, yes, but also religious Jews. Because when I speak, they say, oh, after all, you're a Palestinian. So I document everything I say from Jewish sources. Justice must be linked to security. We want Israel to live in peace and security. But Israel has to do justice. There is no security if there is no justice. That's why Israel cannot achieve secure, total security. Can. Justice must be linked to nonviolence. Sabir is committed to nonviolence. We are against any violence. But we believe that we must resist evil. We must resist injustice. We must resist oppression. But we need to do it through the power of nonviolence. Justice must be linked to peace. There is no peace without justice. And finally, the seventh point justice can open the way for reconciliation and hopefully forgiveness. So brothers and sisters, I challenge you to read the book and engage with us in the work of a just peace that all the people of Palestine and Israel can live in peace, security, and human dignity. At this time, now we will stop. It will take a minute, maybe just to be to check whether we are using the right PowerPoint, and then we can begin. shorten it, we will skip some of the some of the slides. But I think we can we can begin. I've asked a couple of people, friends, to read the slides. So 
Um, and I will make some comments on some of them, some of them, some others. We just look at them and read them. Yeah, so. I'd like to begin with uh, with this logo. This is the Sabine logo. But I want to say that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's important to just tell you about it so that you know where it's coming from. Sabine is Arabic for two, uh, it has two meanings in Arabic. It's also significant to say that uh, the word Sabine is found in Hebrew. It's found and it's used by Muslims. It's found in the Quran. So it means the way. For us Christians, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. But it also has another meaning. It is a spring of water, water. And so you find the water coming down from the foot of the cross um, and on, the, on the road, on the path. On this. So you see it, so it's very meaningful. And after we chose the word Sabine, I discovered that the earliest name for the followers of Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem, according to the book of Acts, were known as the people of the way. So it's a beautiful word. We are, my friends, we are on a journey. We are on a journey for justice journey for peace, journey for reconciliation. And I would like you to, to walk with us the journey for justice. Okay, next. Uh, Sabil, officially, Sabil is Sabil Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center. In Jerusalem, we have a branch inside Israel. Uh, in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, we believe it's occupied territory. So, uh, but we have a branch of Sabine in, in Nazareth. And we have staff there. Okay. Now, unfortunately, again, uh, we've skipped a number, of, uh, a, a number of slides, but let's look at the next one. Uh, we're going to skip that. Skip that. Skip that. <laughs> Skip that. Yeah, we'll, we'll begin with Herzl. He's, he's recognized as the founder. Theodor Herzl is recognized as the founder of political Zionism. In his, so let's read what he has, what he has written in his diary. On June 12, 1895, Herzl wrote in his diary, quote, When we occupy the land, we must ex appropriate gently the private property on the estates assigned to us. We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procure, procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it any employment in our country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. That's what uh, he wrote this a uh, few years before uh, 1897, when the first uh, uh, when when Zionism as a movement came into being. So you could, you could tell what the way he thought. It's very important to remember he was talking in the context of colonialism and imperialism. And uh, that's the context that he knew. Okay, this is, many of you probably know these maps. Because they tell the story. They tell the story of Palestine. I am speaking, obviously, from a Palestinian perspective. So, um, many people, uh, when I speak, many people who are very much pro-Israel, uh, they would say, oh, we want to hear the other side. 
I say, my friends, this is the other side. Because most people have been informed about uh, the Jewish side of the story. Most people don't know this side of the story. So let me, as briefly as I can, because I can give a long lecture on these four maps, but I think it's important to, uh, to, re to look at it from, uh, from my, my perspective. So the, the first map on the left. Palestine, the green color is, uh, represents the people of the land, the Palestinians. The, the white dots represent uh, Jewish presence and Jewish numbers. So the percentages, you know, most of the people of the land uh, were Palestinians. Now, it's important, and again, uh, it can, can be discussed more, more uh, thoroughly, that we always had Jews in the country. So the, the Palestinians, they were Jews there for, for many years, long before Zionism started. Um, and, uh, and there were Christians there for 2,000 years from the time of Jesus Christ. And then the Muslims came in the 7th century. So all of us, since the 2nd century, we were known as Palestinians because the name Palestine came into being by the Romans uh, after the Second Jewish Revolt. And so all of us Jews were known as Palestinians. They spoke Arabic like we did, um, and Muslims and Christians spoke Arabic as well. So this is our language, and we were all Palestinians. But here we are talking now, by 1946, a good number of uh, Jewish Zionist immigrants were coming into the country, and their, in a, and their numbers was increasing. But still, Jews owned less than 6% of the land of Palestine. This is very important. Even when the State of Israel came into being, Jews owned less than 6% of the land of Palestine that they had purchased. Now, after that, look at the second uh, second map. Um, the partition of Palestine took place in 1947. Uh, the Holocaust had taken place. The situation of the Jewish people was terrible because of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, and they were trying to push now the, the British and the Americans to try to um, uh, to partition the country. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. The United Nations, in the partitioning of Palestine, uh, they gave the Jewish people in Palestine, who were the minority of the people, they gave them gratis. 55% of the land. So all the white in the second map was given to the Jewish people who owned less than 6%, they were given around 55%. And the majority of the people on the land, the Palestinians, were given 45% of the land. And the Palestinians immediately rejected. They said, unfair. What about self what about giving the people self decision? The people of the land. What about what President uh, President Wilson was talking about in, in the whole question of uh, self-determination. But not for Palestine. Because of the Balfour Declaration about in 1917. The British had committed themselves to the Zionists that they would give them a home in Palestine. So it's a long story, but that's what they did. The moment that the Zionists got 
the endorsement of the United Nations that they are 55 percent, they immediately started to push the Palestinians from those 55 percent. Now, I, my family, this is where my story comes in. My family was living in a small town south of the Sea of Galilee called Bisan. During Jesus' uh, life on earth, uh, when he was uh, uh, Jesus uh, living, uh, my, my, my town was known as Kithopolis. And it was, it was part of the Decapolis cities, the ten cities that you read about in the New Testament. So it was the only city of the Decapolis that was west of the Jordan River. Um, so that's Bissan. That's Bissan. Today it's called Beit Shan, which is the original, original Canaanite name of the, of the city. Uh, so we were living south of the Sea of Galilee, and the Zionists came, that's before the, the state of Israel came into being. So before 9, 14th of May 1948, was before that, we were occupied by the Zionists, we did not have an army, there was no battle, they just marched through town. I was a boy of 11 years old. And I remember seeing them coming through town. And a um, few days after, they gave us an order that we need to get out of town. And it was very clear. They said, if you don't leave, we will kill you. You can check history. My father represented the Anglican Church in Bissan, although he was not a priest and he was not um, um, uh, uh, he was not part of the, the clergy, but my father was a goldsmith, silversmith. He had a great business in Bissan because around Bissan we had over 20 villages and towns, Palestinians, all around. All of those, that, that area, everything was destroyed by the Zionists. Now you go to Bissan, you cannot find the trace of all those over 20 villages that were around there. Bissan was mainly Muslim, but we had three churches in town and a <coughs> Christian community there. The Orthodox Church, which is the indigenous church of the land, a Roman Catholic Church, and a very small Anglican church there. And my father, the military governor, the Jewish military, Zionist military governor, told the heads of the churches, we did not have a priest in Bissan. My father represented the church, and they were sent after by the military governor, and the Qadi, Muslim, uh, representing the Muslim community, he, got, he took them, he sent after them, and he told them two hours to get out of town, and if you don't leave, we will kill you. So we had no choice. We, were, we had to meet in the center of town. They divided us into two groups, Muslims on one side, Christians on the other. They took all the Muslims down the Jordan River, just a few kilometers down. They sent all the Muslims to Jordan, and they took us Christians and dumped us outside Nazareth, the town of Nazareth. Nazareth was still with the Palestinians. Still with the Arabs. So we were not there never to go back to our town, never to have our property, our business, our homes, which my father had built. What happened to my family happened to thousands and thousands of Palestinian families. Now, some from Palestinians <coughs> fled in fear because it spread within Palestine what the Zionists have done in the town, in the village of Deir Yassin, just outside Jerusalem, where the Zionist militias killed over a hundred men, women, and children. It's very famous. You can read about it, you can Google it, and you will see the story of Deir Yassin and the massacre of Deir Yassin. <clears throat> so many people fled because they were afraid. 
Some of us, some people did not flee, like my family did not flee. At that point, we were evicted because we were told, if you don't get out, we will kill you. Now, in order for Israel, that Israel came into being, the government, that Israel state, in order to prevent the Palestinians from returning, Israel bulldozed, bulldozed, around 500 towns and villages throughout Palestine. So if the refugees dared to return, some of them wanted to return, some of them tried to return, and they were killed by the uh, Zionist forces. So, <clears throat> This is the story of Palestine. This is what happened. This is what happened. Now, in 1967, oh, sorry, let me just say, Israel had 55%, as I told you, given to it by the United Nations. But they were so successful in driving out the Palestinians, people flying, fleeing, or forced out by the Zionists. They were so successful, they did not stop with the 55%. They kept going. When they stopped, they have taken 78% of Palestine. This is map number three. The white of number, number three. Um, all of it was taken. What was left was 22%, which makes up the West Bank, the big part Number, number three, and the small green part in the Gaza Strip. This is my friends. This is history. This is history. In 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. So everything now is under the occupation of Israel. And in number four, Map number four, Israel started to build the settlements. Next, next one. And this is the West Bank, and you see the dots are West, are settlements. All the settlements the, and the occupation are illegal under international law. Please remember this. Israel is illegally occupying the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. And Israel refuses to get out. Okay, so this is really the story. I'm sorry to take so much of that time, but I think it is very important, my friends. Okay, next. Okay, um, skip, skip this. Yeah, okay, that's, I want to move quickly into the second part that has to do with the Bible. The Bible, again, I have to skip some of the, some of the sl slides, but uh, uh, the Bible in the service of religious Zionists. Okay, next. Okay, let's read what the book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible says. God said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their figured stones, destroy all their cast images, and demolish all their high places. You shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Okay, so if you ask the question, what is the solution to the indigenous people of the land of Canaan, according to the Bible, this is the first solution. Drive them out. And I need to be very clear here, my friends. I am talking about the government of Israel, and I am talking about extremist Jewish settlers, and Zionist religious, religious Zionist people who